the forest was now boiling with people, for the Vyas villagers had come behind the klezmer to greet Shmuel and his friends. Hannah hung back. More people meant more greetings and more excuses. It was worse than any family party at home. At home? The skin on her face suddenly stretched tight across her cheekbones, and her eyes began to prickle with tears. Where was her home? She forced herself to recall the house in New Rochelle with its borders of flowers and the flagstone walk, but the image seemed to be fading, especially when compared with the forest full of villagers and the tiny house and the horse barn she'd just left hours before. A hand on her arm riveted her to the moment. Ham Haya, Gidel said, come and meet your new aunt-to-be. Pulling Hannah, Hannah past the noisy celebrants, Gidel led her to the one wagon facing the rest, where the men were busy at work encouraging the two strong horse, workout horses to turn around. On that wagon sat two people, one older older man dressed in all black and a white prayer shawl across his shoulders, a book in his lap. The other was one of the most beautiful women Hannah had ever seen, like a movie star. She was in all white with an elegantly be beaded headdress capping her hair. The hair was jet black, so black that it didn't even have lighter highlights and electric with curls spilling over her shoulders. There were gold rings on her fingers. There were gold rings on her fingers and gold dangling from her ears. She had a strong nose and a fierce, piercing look like a bird of prey. Faya, Gidel said. This is my niece, Chaya. Hannah wondered how, with all the noise and excitement, Faya had even heard Gidel's introduction. But she looked down from the wagon, those eagle eyes staring. Then she smiled, not at all fiercely, but even shyly. The Lubliner, come, you must be exhausted walking all this way after being so sick. Shmuel would never forgive me if I did not let you ride. What a pretty dress. You put us all to shame. She leaned down and offered her hand. I will not say I told you so, Gidel whispered in Hannah's ear, but I did. As if in dream, Hannah reached up for Faya's hand. She expected a princess's hand, small, fine-boned, and soft. But Faya's fan was large and strong with calluses in the palm. When she was set by Faya's side, she could smell a scent on her hair and dress, like roses and wood shavings after a long rain. Now, Faya said, turning towards her and smiling broadly, tell me about Lublin. The bride's wagon was turned around at last, and the procession started up again. This time, the klezmer was behind, far back at the end of the line, the villagers. Hannah's new friends danced by the wagon's side. Hands joined, singing, Who asked you to be married? Who asked you to be buried alive? You know that no one forced you. You took this madness on yourself. I always hated the shekel, Faya said. Such a gloomy song for a so glorious an event. What's the shekel? Hannah asked. The wedding dance your friends are doing. You do not play such games in love. Perhaps you are smarter than we. Hannah looked down at the girls. Some younger girls had joined them, and the line was twisting and turning to the rhythm of the song. New Rochelle, she murmured, though this time it was more a prayer than a statement. Faya didn't seem to hear. Oh, Chaya, never mind, the Sherelle. We will sing and dance other things all night long. The grandmothers would dance the bob dance as well. Shmuel's grandmother is gone. May she rest in peace. But Gidel can dance with my grandmother. You should see my grandmother so light and quick. And you too, Chaya, you will dance. Oh, only if you are feeling well enough. We will have great fun. You will see. She patted Hannah's hand. The wagon bumped along the road, swaying from side to side. Hannah wished she could get down and stare longly at the ground. What is it, Chayala? Faya asked. Is it much longer? Around one more bend and there will be. At my village, at Vask. Would you believe it? My village for, but not a few more hours. And then my village no more. And would you guess that as excited as I am about marrying my beloved Shmuel, a part of me is also afraid? Hannah laughed out loud. Shmuel said the same thing this morning. Did he? Did he? Faya's eyes lit up and suddenly she looked very young. Not that much older than Hannah. Tell me exactly what he said. Hannah closed her eyes, trying to remember. He said, oh, he said, yes. He said he wasn't afraid of being married, only getting married. Reb Brock cleared his throat loudly. Oh, hiya, Faya said, ignoring her father. Thank you for telling me that. She gave Hannah a hug. We are going to be such friends, you and I. Best friends. Life will be good to us forever and ever. I know. The wagon made a wide turn around the bend in the path. The horse is straining mightily. One blew out its nostrils, a loud huffing. Ahead where the path widened out was a large meadow, and beyond it, a town. Hannah called over her shoulders to the dancing girls. We're here! The world words springing easily to her mouth. The girls dropped hands and stared down the path. When Hannah looked up again, she could see the Vias laid out on the far end of the meadow, picture, po picture postcard pretty. Small houses nestled in a line. 
on the larger buildings, none higher than three stories, stood behind like mothers with their children. As the horses pulled them closer, Hannah could distinguish a central open market with stalls, surrounded by stores. There was a pharmacy topped by a large black sign, a barber shop with a familiar peppermint stick, a glass-fronted tavern, and a dozen other shops. In the middle of the market, a tall wooden pole supported a bell. Behind the open market was a towering wooden building with four separate roof sections and a fenced-in courtyard. The dominant color was brown. Brown wooden buildings, brown sandy streets, as if it were a faded photograph. Yet, it was real. Papa, she said, turning to him, what are those automobiles and trucks doing in front of the shul? She pointed down to one of the big buildings. Is it a surprise for the wedding? Oh, Papa! She gave him a hug, and his normally dour face lit up. Hannah looked down where Faya was painting. In the middle of the brown landscape, like a dark stain, were three old-fashioned cars, like twelve army trucks, strung out behind. She gave an involuntary shudder, reminded of her something. She couldn't think what. Faya's father cleared his throat and closed the book on his lap. You do not make surprises, he said gruffly. Only my children make surprises. Then what are those automobiles and trucks doing in front of our shul? Faya asked. The wagon continued slow side to side pace towards the town, but behind it all the villagers grew silent, as one by one they noticed what sat in front of the synagogue. Shmuel hurried for hurried forward. Penning his hand on the wagon close to Faya's hand, but not quite touching it, he addressed her father formally. Reborsk, excuse me, Shmuel said, but do you know just what lies ahead? I am not a fortune teller, nor yet a bashan, Rob Burish said. It is to God you must address such questions. Just then, the front of the, the door of the first cart opened, and a man in a black uniform with high black boots stepped out. He turned and opened the car's black door. Another man, similarly dressed, unfolded himself from the seat. The metals on his chest caught the light from the spring sun, somehow sending undecipherable signals across the market to them. Somehow, the bashan materialized in front of the wagon. He pointed to the man with the medals and cried out, I see the Malachamavas. I see the angel of death. Hannah felt the breath catch in her throat. Malachamavas. That was her grandfather's phrase. The one he shouted at her when she drew the long, num long number on her arm. Angel of death. Slowly, carefully, she turned to Shmuel, afraid to move too quickly. Afraid she might not be quick enough. Please, Shmuel, what year is it? He laughed. There was little brightness in it. They do not have the same year in Lebanon. Please. Faya put his hand on ha put her hand on Hannah's. Silly child, she said her voice curiously hushed. It's 5701. 5701. Uh, this can't be the future, Hannah said. It doesn't look like the future. You don't have movies or new cars or her voice was hoarse. She's been this way ever since she arrived in Bride Faya. Shmuel shaking her head. Sometimes she is lucid. Other times she talks over shells and needles and snakes. He tapped his finger to his forehead. It's the sickness, I think, and the loss of her parents. Now she talks of the future. I think the child means loin Christian loch, according to the Christian calendar. They do not know from Jewish calendar in Lebanon, Faya asked. 1942, several days before Passover, the Bashan said. Before Passover, Hannah drew in a deep breath, and then all of a sudden she knew. She knew beyond any doubt where she was. She was not Hannah Stern of New Rochelle, at least not anymore. Though still had she still had Hannah's memories. Those memories, she laughed, at least, might serve as a warning. Those men down there, she cried out desperately, they're not wedding guests. They're Nazis. Nazis, do you understand? They kill people. They killed, killed, will kill Jews. Hundreds of them, thousands of the six million of them. I know. Don't ask me how I know. I know. We have to turn the wagons around. We have to run. Rob Bjork shook his head. There are not six million Jews in all of Poland, my child. No, Rabbi, six million in Poland, in Germany, in Holland, in France. And child, such a number. He shook his hands and smiled, but the corners of his Ned mouth turned down instead of up. As far as running, where would we run to? God is everywhere. There will be Nazis among us. No, my child, we do not tremble before mere men. It is before God whom we must tremble, only God. We will go ahead just as we have planned. After all, this is our shtel, not theirs, and there is still a wedding to be made. He lifted his hand. On his signal, the wagon started up across the last few yards to the market. As they moved closer, more men in dark uniforms got out of the cars and truck cabs. They made a perfect circle in front of the synagogue gores like a steel trap with its gaping jaws ready to be sprung.